Hi everybody, it's Diane from Diane's Corner. Well, this morning we had a little snow and now it's uh, kind of clearing up and I'm down here on, I'm gonna show you where I am, on First Avenue Northeast, here it is. First Avenue Northeast. And so this is the, um, and that's the uh, 85 over there. And then this is um, Kevin Hushka. He has his, uh, he maintains uh, vehicles and trucks and those kind of things, great mechanic. And um, so I'm here at the elevator row again. As you can see, it goes all the way to Main Street. So I have to read outside, but it looks like that wind is gonna be a little bit too much. So I'm gonna get back into my car here. And we can look at another um, Remember yesterday we had the rugby billing company. So you can picture that here on uh, elevator row. And we had the Belfield grain and feed elevator. And now today we're going to do the um, Farmers Union elevator, which is quite a complex in 1962. You can see how that all works up there. I find elevators very, very interesting. Enormous buildings. There's the grain trucks. There, where they weigh the grain. It says, Belfield Farmers Union Elevator is shown in the upper photo with its latest annex, completed in 1958. The Farmers Elevator was started on July 1st, 1916 with R.J. Gray as the first president. Directors at that time were C.H. Adams, Chaz E. Davis, Otto Olga, Ugla, L. F. Strouch, W. H. Cameron, and Gust Wog. Gust Wog became president of the company about 1925. The first elevator occupied by Farmers Union was located just east of the present building and burned to the ground shortly after the company was formed. The second elevator bought from N.J. Steffen also burned in the early 1920s. The elevator was rebuilt and in 1929, the second edition was built. The Farmers Union Elevator Company presently has some 500 stockholders. And here's a, here's a real nice picture here. Look at that calendar, the City Cafe. I'm not sure if that is what all this is, but look at the old telephone. <laughs> and look at the old adding machine, I just love it. And then uh, here's the picture. That's Les Thompson there and Jack Cameron there. So Jack Cameron, who was manager for many years, is shown in this 1930 photo with his assistant, Les Thompson. Les started working for the company in the fall of 1929 and became manager in 1937 when Jack Cameron and his wife retired and moved to Greeley, Colorado. So that's the Farmers Union Elevator Company. At uh, this same site, which is quite uh, interesting. And I also had a, another picture, let's see, of Elevator Row. These are, this is not kind of the stages of Belfield's growth here. And these were all taken after 1900. It um, shows this elevator row, though. I thought this was kind of interesting. Kept get this on. There you see this. Belfield from 1911. 
I'm just gonna get closer here. Whoops, too close. So there's those elevators. I don't know if you can see them or not. I'm gonna put it up here. There, there is the elevators. That's kind of a good picture, I think. Belfield, North Dakota. And here there is the um, the Castle House, the Hollander House. And uh, there's the school. Let's see, that's the school right there. That's the Castle House. And here's that row of elevators I was talking about that stretch across there. So I wanted to mention that one. Then I also found a, an interesting article. Somebody mentioned that bentonite clay. And um, I did find that article about Frank Kessel, who had an interest in industry for Belfield. Here's his family, the Frank Kessel family. Let's see if I can get this situated here. Okay, so in the back row, Ignatius, there's Ignatius, Alois, Fred, Agnes, George, Leo, and Richard. And in the front row, Agatha, Len, Mary, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Castle, her name was Clara, Angeline, Nick, and Florence. So that was their large family. It says Frank Castle came to the Belfield community in the year 1908. He came with his parents who had come immigrated from Russia. Mr. Kessel worked at various trades in the community and also held down a job as county assessor in Buildings County. In 1906, he homesteaded, homesteaded 11 miles north and three miles east of Belfield, and he farmed for a spell along with his brother they bought the Gorm Place near Government Creek, and it just kind of goes on into their history. They stocked the place with cattle and horses, and Joe st stayed with him until he was called to the service in 1917. And uh, Joe sol sold his share out to Frank, and after this, Frank ran the ranch. And uh, Frank... He also bought north of there near Franks Creek until 1927 when he moved to Belfield. Frank was in his prime, when he was in his prime, was one of the bigger landowners in Billings County and at one time had his herd built up to 200 head of cattle and about the same amount of horses. And there is another article I read that um, there was a, a blizzard in around 19. 27 and he lost most of that herd but while mr kessel was still living in the badlands he became interested in some of the natural resources of the badlands frank a man of vision saw possibilities of a mud or clay called bentonite that lay in great quantities in certain places in the breaks how anyway anyhow he interested certain businessmen from Jamestown in the idea, and a mud plant was built in 1931. The first one burned down shortly after it was built, and so another plant was immediately built. Walt Ray of Medora was another local shareholder in this mud plant venture. An excerpt from the October 2nd, 1931 edition of the Belfield Review goes like this. Mr. Kessel bought to this office three samples of the product, the raw material, which is a brown color, and also two mixed samples, one a brown and the other a greenish color. These are sort of a calcimine preparation, but when properly mixed, the preparation maintains a glossy finish, which ordinarily calcimine does not. One local firm has used the preparation, which was made by Mr. Kessel, and is very much pleased with the results. 
The product, as it was found, can be used as silver polish or any kind of cleaner and will remove dirt and grit that even lye water cannot remove. The bentonite, which is dried and ground powder, fine, is also used in refining oils, animal fats, and gasoline. It has exceptionally fine filtering qualities and is used extensively by the valet cleaners and dryers of Minot in filtering the gasoline for their plant. A total of 149 uses have been found for the product. We sincerely believe that if offers, it offers wonderful possibilities, and although it is doubtful whether the plant will operate for several months or more, when the time comes for those interested in the product to see their way clear to get into the operation, it, it will mean a great deal to the city of Belfield. We have been informed that if the plant should run at full capacity 24 hours a day, it will employ 50 or more men. Anyone interested in investing money communicate with Mr. Kessel. The plant was dismantled a short time later and bought by a concern in South Dakota. We understand that it has been operating ever since. This was Belfield's last big fling at industry, and Mr. Frank Kessel almost made it. So an interesting footnote to this bentonite plant is that while Mr. Kessel had faith in the project, the times were rough in this 30s. Oh, yeah. Money was hard to come by, and many people were skeptical. Frank knew that the day would come when the product would be in demand, and come it did, with the discovery of oil in southwestern North Dakota in 1953. This man of vision was, all, was right all the time. Frank Kessel did not live to see the discovery of oil, but somehow he foresaw things that others could not see. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Kessel, during this time, were raising a large family of 13 children, eight boys and five girls. All the boys except Richard live in Belfield. Their father has gone to his rest, but their mother still lives in Belfield and has seen her sons make good in an, another type of indu industry. And um, I wanted to mention that I did find a uh, kind of honor them too because of, of the patriotism of this uh, family, the Frank Kessel family here. During World War II, six of the eight sons served in the U.S. Armed Forces. Ignatius, Fred, Richard, Alois, and Nick served overseas. Leo was stationed in the United States. So he was a, a very dedicated man to his family and his country and his, his church. And uh, so that is kind of a interesting article of uh, yeah i i was thinking about that trying to manufacture this clay into useful pla uh, products well as he tried uh, he he was definitely a man of vision and so i really appreciate his work for belfield and his whole family too for that matter so i just want to say Thank you for joining me on this January 21st day. Have a good day. Bye now.